What's up everybody? So in this video we're going to be talking about transport, more specifically membrane transport. So remember how I said your cell membrane is a lot like the walls of a house, right? It can do protection, it can do recognition, it can control who and what goes in and out of your house, right? The, a cell has a lot of function, your cell membrane has a lot of function functions, but we're going to specifically focus on the one of transport. We're going to focus on membrane transport in this video. So if you don't know anything about a cell structure, cell membrane structure, you really need to watch the cell membrane structure video first, where I explain everything about the cell structure that you need to know. That'll make this video a million times more easy for you. Okay, so let's just get into it. So for membrane transport, there are four, the deal is that you need to understand four kinds of membrane transport, including simple diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, active transport. Now, you need to know all of these, and we're gonna make them very clear in this video. Now, these three here in green fall under the category passive, okay? All of these ways require no energy, no energy from the cell, no ATP from the cell at all. It happens very naturally, very easily, and you'll see what I mean in this video. And then this other one here called active transport, it falls under the category of active. It's its own category. It is its entire. It is its own category, right? It is active. It requires energy. It requires ATP. So it's quite different from these other ones here. So let's just start with the most easy one, in my opinion, which is simple diffusion. Okay. So this is a passive one. So to understand simple diffusion, we need to understand diffusion. So what is diffusion? I have this beautiful, sexy diagram here, all made by me to explain this for you, okay? So here we have the outside. This represents the outside, and we have a lot of these little suns representing heat. So outside it's, guess what, really, really hot, right? But in the inside, it's relatively cold. There's only one sun here, so it's a little bit colder on the inside than the outside. Now I'm sure you guys have done this. Let's say it's a super hot summer day and you decide to be stupid and you just open the door and you completely forget about the door and it gets and your parents get really angry at you because later on guess what happened the house gets really hot right so we can imagine what happens here what do you think is going to happen right the heat is going to move from where there's a lot of heat to where there's a little bit of heat right these heat things will move in until the inside of the house is equally as warm as the outside right and this is where your parents are really going to be mad at you so what is this this was diffusion diffusion is quite simply a term used to describe the process of things moving from where there's a lot, so a lot of heat, to where there's a little bit of heat, okay? I can give you another example. It's basically, um, the simplest way of saying it is it, it is basically spreading out. Diffusion means spreading out. So for example, if we take perfume as a perfume, say you're about to go on a date and you spray yourself with perfume uh, on, your, on, your, on your armpit and you realize, oh, that's really, really, really strong, right? And then, you, and then after a while, you notice the smell gets weaker, okay, it gets diluted. That's because these little um, perfume particles started diffusing, they started spreading out, they started going from where there's a lot in your armpit to where there's a little bit, to the rest, to the outside world, to the, to the air, right? So it starts diffusing, starts spreading out, so it doesn't smell as strong anymore, right? So that's another example of diffusion, okay? So if you understand diffusion, then understanding simple diffusion should be very straightforward. So here we have, now we're going into simple diffusion. So what we have here is our bilayer, right? Our phospholipid bilayer, a membrane, a membrane um, of our cell. Now this area here is gonna represent the outside of our cell and this will represent the inside of our cell. Now remember that simple diffusion is an example of passive transport. It requires no energy and we'll see what that means right now. Now, when we talk about, I need to clarify this, when we talk about, when I'm gonna introduce these four um, examples of membrane transport, we're always gonna consider four key things, and you'll see what I mean. So these four key things is gonna be repeating throughout this whole video, and you'll see. So first, simple diffusion, the first thing we need to know is simple diffusion, it's just involving the membrane. Notice, there's no proteins here, no proteins involved in simple diffusion. So that's thing one. You need to understand it's simply a membrane. Now thing two is, remember we just talked about uh, what diffusion is, it needs this um, gradient, right? It needs uh, this idea that I was talking about. One area where there's a lot of this molecule 
and one area where there's a little of this molecule. So let me show you. So let's say the outside of the cell has a lot of this particular molecule and the inside has very little, okay? Very little. We need this idea. We need this idea. And there's, this, and there's a name for this that you need to understand, a word, a key word for this called concentration gradient. We need a concentration gradient. Concentration gradient, this just means that there's a lot of a substance in one area and a little bit in another area. That's a concentration gradient. Now, in simple diffusion, the natural process is going to happen. The molecule will move from where there's a lot of the molecule to where there's a little bit of the molecule until it's even. So, in simple diffusion, the molecule will move down the concentration gradient. So it's gonna follow the concentration gradient. So that's why I put a tick here. This tick represents that it's gonna follow this concentration gradient and the molecule, whichever molecule we're talking about, will move from where there's a lot to where there's a little. It's going down the concentration gradient. So that's the second important thing about simple diffusion we need to understand. The molecule will only need a membrane and it will move from where there's a lot to where there's a little. We call that moving down the concentration gradient or along the concentration gradient, okay? If this scenario happened, let me show you, if the molecule moved from where there's a little to where there's a lot, that would be called against the concentration gradient. That would be moving against the concentration gradient. That is not simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is moving down the concentration gradient. And it makes sense. Do you think, do you think this process of moving down the concentration gradient will take energy? Do you think this costs the cell any ATP? Does it doesn't need to spend any money to make this happen? No, right? You can think of this in terms of skiing, right? Say you have, say you're on the top of the mountain, right? A lot of height. And then there's the bottom of the mountain, little height, right? To go down the mountain skiing, does that require you any, any energy? No, you just slide down. It takes no energy. But if you had to walk up the mountain, if you've ever tried to walk up a mountain of skis, you'd know how hard this is. If you had to walk against this concentration gradient, it would require energy. It would take so much effort. But because we're talking about simple diffusion, which is the when molecules move down the concentration gradient, no energy is required. So that's our third point. No ATP is required, no energy, okay? So these are three big things. Simple diffusion involves solely the membrane, okay? That's thing one. Thing two is it needs a concentration gradient. So one area, one side of the membrane needs to have a lot of it, and the other side needs to have a little, and it's gonna move down the concentration gradient, okay? From where there's a lot to where there's a little. That's thing two. And because of this, moving down the concentration gradient, the cell spends no energy. It doesn't need to spend any ATP. Okay, great. Nearly done with this one. The last thing we need to understand is we need to know what kind of molecules can do simple diffusion because not every molecule can do this. Not every molecule, only specific kinds of molecules. Okay, so when we think about the molecule, we need to think about its size and its charge. So we need to think about whether it's big or small or whether it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Okay, let me show you what I mean. So let's take this molecule here. Oxygen is a perfect example. So oxygen suits this. That is why oxygen can do simple diffusion. It is small, why does small matter? Okay, oxygen is super small, it's only two O's. O, O, that's O2. Okay, so it's super small. So therefore, it can wiggle waggle through these phospholipids. So if it encounters this layer, it can be like, oh, excuse me, let me through, and it can go all the way through. So being small, is very important for simple diffusion. Big molecules will not be able to wiggle waggle through here, okay? That's thing one. The next thing is it should ideally be hydrophobic. It should ideally like areas where there's no water, okay? Because otherwise this would happen. Say oxygen um, loved water, okay? So if it started, even though it's small enough, if it was able to wiggle waggle, it would reach this part. Now remember from the membrane structure video that the fatty acids, they are hydro phobic they hate water so they're arranging themselves away from the waters because the outside of the cell will have water and the inside will have water so these phosphate heads they love the water they're trying to be in the water whereas these fatty acid tails are arranging away from the water there's no water here they're hydrophobic so if this little oxygen um, loved water and hated areas where there was no water then it would be here and be like oh no water i'm going back it would never be able to cross because to be able to cross it must go through this area where there's no water so therefore, these molecules must not, only must not only be small to be able to wiggle waggle, they should also 
be slightly hydrophobic. They should be okay with being in areas where there's no water. So that when it wiggle waggles, it's like, mm, I'm all right. I, I don't mind when there's no water. And it can continue and go through. So that's very important. That is the key things we need to know about simple diffusion. No proteins, only membrane. It needs to go. The molecules move down the concentration gradient from where there's a lot to where there's a little. Because of this, because of this natural process, no ATP is required, okay? And the kind of molecules that can do this need to be small and hydrophobic. I hope that makes sense because that's really the fundamentals, the key um, things you need to understand, okay? Now, according to the book, right, you guys need to know one real example of this. So you, now you understand the concept of simple diffusion. Let's use a real example that happens in the cell, okay? And this example is pretty, pretty important. So you know inside your cell, right, you have a lot of organelles, one of which, one of which is this mitochondria. Now, the mitochondria, it is very important. It does something called cell respiration. Cell respiration is the, the fancy name, the science name of, of um, making ATP, okay? This is the organelle, the powerhouse of the cell. It makes the money. It makes the ATP, okay? ATP is important because it makes everything else happen in your body. It's like money. Now, to make ATP, it needs oxygen. So it's going to use oxygen, okay, as one of the materials, and it's going to make ATP. And then one of the waste products, like, that it makes is carbon dioxide, right? It's like when you when you make something in a, in a, in a warehouse, not only do you make a beautiful product, project, product, but you're also going to make a mess, right, in the process. You're going to make some dust, some... Um, some un, some papers and stuff that are not needed, all these waste things. So the same thing here, this mitochondria is going to use the oxygen, the material, and it's going to make ATP. But in the process, it's also making this byproduct or this waste product called carbon dioxide. Okay, now, where am I going with this? So remember, we, we have lungs, right? We can inhale oxygen. So we consistently bring in a lot of these this oxygen molecules into our body, into our bloodstream. And our bloodstream will bring these oxygen to our cells. So we will have a lot of oxygen constantly coming to our cells, right? There's a high concentration of oxygen as long as we can breathe, right? As long as you're not drowning or something. So you have a lot of high concentration of this oxygen right outside your cell. But your mitochondria is always using the oxygen once it gets inside the cell. As soon as it comes in, it grabs it and uses it to make um, ATP. So it, inside the cell, they never manage to build up. They always get used immediately. So because of this, there's always this gradient. There's a lot outside your cell and a little bit inside your cell. So because of this gradient, this, is, this, makes, um, this makes simple diffusion possible. Because now, because this oxygen is constantly being used by your mitochondria, it makes this gradient so that the next oxygen um, has this gradient to follow. It will move down the concentration gradient so that the mitochondria can use the next one. And then it will get used. And then that will, this process will keep going, okay? So understand, this is one real example here of simple diffusion. Now, if we look at the other side, as a byproduct, carbon dioxide is consistently being made. It's consistently being made, right? And you, remember, not only do you inhale oxygen, you also constantly exhale carbon dioxide. So your body is always getting rid of this carbon dioxide. So it never manages to build up outside your cell. It's always being exhaled. So because of that, you have a lot of this carbon dioxide building up inside your cells, and then in the outside of your cells, they're constantly being removed. So you always have this concentration gradient, a lot inside your cell and a little bit on the outside. So because of this, simple diffusion can also easily happen. And this carbon dioxide can move down and out of the cells to your lungs where they can get removed from your body. Okay, so this is one kind of real example, cell respiration, where simple diffusion is used with these two gases. Okay, um, and remember, carbon dioxide, perfect. It's a small molecule and it's hydrophobic, so it can do this. Okay, one more key term you need to know before we move on to the next one is non-selective. So simple diffusion is non-selective. This means simple, simple diffusion is not picky. It doesn't selective, only, not, um, it's not picky. So not only um, some molecules can do it, any molecule that is small and hydrophobic can pass through the membrane. Any molecule that is small and hydrophobic can do simple diffusion. It is not selective in the sense that only one kind of molecule can do it, okay? As long as you fit these criteria, you can do it. So we consider simple diffusion to be non-selective, non-picky for that, for that reason. And we'll see the other kinds of transport and how they are selective. They're actually selective. Okay, great. So that's it for simple diffusion. I hope that makes sense. Remember these four things. I'll have a summary at the end of the video 
where um, you can you can check that out. So let's now get on to the next one. Okay, so we covered now this one. Let's now talk about facilitated diffusion because it's quite similar, but there's a slight slight difference. Remember, facilitated diffusion. Here we have it is a kind of passive transport as well. So it's also going to require no energy. Now, notice what's different about this diagram. We have a membrane, perfect, but we also have these now, which simple diffusion did not have. We have these proteins, these proteins, right? Hmm, so that, that's interesting. So that's one way in which facilitated diffusion is different. Now let's first take a look at these proteins and describe them a bit before we go into the process, okay? Because it's important. So there are two kinds of proteins you need to know about. Channel protein, which is, hence the name, there's a channel, a little pathway connecting the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Okay, great. And there's this carrier protein, which is a bit different. It doesn't have a single channel. It rather has this little hand area where it grabs a molecule and it will drag it to the other side. It's a bit different, and we'll talk more about it in this video. So let's first go for the channel one. So the channel one... Um, is important to understand that this one is only involved in passive transport, okay? Remember I told you there are two kinds of big categories of transport, active and passive, okay? Now, this little guy here, let me show you again. This little one, channel protein, is only involved in passive transport. This one will never be used, um, you guys don't, um, for you guys, this one will never be used in active transport, only in passive, okay? It's only used for passive transport. Um, this molecule only uh, transports polar substances, so substances that love water. And this will make sense in this video, I'll explain it. Now, this one cannot change shape. It will always be in this shape, and we'll see about that also later in this video. Now, a carrier protein is a little bit different. So, it is involved in both active and passive transport. So, it is involved in passive transport, so it will be involved in facilitated diffusion, which is a passive process. But you'll see later when we talk about active transport, this one can also be used in active transport. So not only in passive transport here, but also in active. Okay. Now this one is a bit different from channel protein. It can carry both polar and nonpolar substances. So substances that are hydrophilic or substances that are hydrophobic. Okay. And this one is unique because it changes shape. So it's not constantly this channel shape that allows things to pass through. It's going to change shape, and we'll see about that in this video. Okay, so now that we know the players of this game, okay, we know we got the membrane and we got these two channel, uh, these two proteins, membrane proteins, right, these integral proteins, if we had to be precise. Let's now explain uh, the details that we need to know. Okay, let me take a sip of water, please, people. Okay, so let's go to our four points. The first one, very straightforward. You need a protein. So unlike simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion is going to require a protein. Wait a sec. Something is making a lot of noise in my room. Let me go turn that thing off. Okay, that's better. I don't know if you guys could hear, but I could, and that's annoying me. Okay, so thing one is... Unlike simple diffusion, this one needs proteins, okay? So that's thing one. Thing two is, like simple diffusion, because this is a passive process, right? It's a passive transport. It needs a concentration gradient, meaning if we take some molecule, let's take some molecule, there needs to be a lot on one side and a little on the other side. So let's, let's put here. So let's say there's a lot on one side and there's a little bit on the other side. We need this scenario because this molecule needs to move from where there's a lot down to where there's a little. This time it will use one of these proteins. Okay, so that's how it's similar. It also needs to move down this concentration gradient. Okay, and because it's moving only this time, it's not using the membrane, but it's using one of these proteins. That's the big difference. So because of this, because it's moving down the concentration gradient, does it need energy? No, and that's why we call it that's why we call it a passive process. It doesn't need ATP, okay? All the passive ones will not need ATP because they have this gradient. It happens naturally. Okay, awesome. Now, let me mention something. Now, let's go to the trickier part here. What, what molecules need facilitated diffusion? Why can't these molecules just move through the membrane? Why do they need these proteins? Why do they need to use facilitated diffusion? Okay, 
So the mo kind of molecules that will use facilitated diffusion um, can be big or small. Let me show you what I mean. They can be big or small. For example, let's say we use glucose. This is a big molecule. It's got a lot of, it's got carbon, 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 oxygen, hydrogen, many things. It's quite big. So why would this one need facilitated diffusion? Think about it. Do you think it can wiggle waggle through this membrane? No way. It's way too big. No way it's going to wiggle waggle through. So for that reason, it needs a protein channel because a protein channel has a big space here in which this molecule can go and pass through. Okay, so that's one. So a molecule can be big or small. If it's big, it's useful because it can walk, go through the membrane. If it's small, it can go through, maybe oxygen can go through here. If it's another small molecule, it can go through here, right? Just because it's small doesn't mean it can't use this protein, okay? Now, another key thing, what kind of a charge? So let's say, let's use another example here. Let me delete some of these. So we know now they can be big or small, but what if it has a charged charge? So let's say potassium. Potassium is very small. It's only a K, it's only a potassium element. So in theory, it's small enough to wiggle waggle through this layer, but it cannot travel by simple diffusion because it has a charge. Because it has a charge, we call it hydrophilic. So it loves water. It loves water so much that as soon as it gets here, it's like, oh, no water, so it bounces back. So because of this, it needs a protein. It needs a protein because in the protein, the water is connecting from the outside to the inside. So it's water in here. So this potassium or this element or this molecule can easily just go through because in that way, it's always in contact with water. So facilitated diffusion is important not only for um, big molecules which cannot pass through the membrane, but also molecules that are charged, that cannot um, um, stand being in an area without water. Because charged particles, charged molecules love water. They want to be in water. So like this potassium loves being in water. So when it gets there, it just wants to bounce back. So this is important. These proteins allow molecules like these, which cannot pass through the membrane, to be able to pass through the membrane. Okay, great. So this one here, as I said, can only um, carry polar substances like this one. So when, it, when something is charged, we consider it polar. So it can only carry ones that are polar. Any non-polar ones will not be able to go through here. So let's say... Let's say we have, um, let's say this one was nonpolar. It's actually polar because it's glucose, but let's pretend it's not. Say it was nonpolar. As soon as it goes here, so it would prefer to go through the membrane, okay? Because it doesn't like being in water that much. So a, a, mo a molecule that doesn't like being in water that much, would, would it like to go through this channel because there's water in this channel? No, right? So a molecule that doesn't like water would not go through this channel because there's water in there. It would prefer to not go through the water area. So that's important to understand. So know that these channels are very important for bigger molecules and for molecules that are hydrophobic, meaning they cannot pass through here, even if they're small enough. They need to go through this channel. Okay, great. Now, you need to know one other kind of key concept here. This one here, the channel protein, okay? This channel protein can sometimes be, we give it a term, we call it gated, gated, because it has a kind of gate on it. So it's not always open. So let's say this potassium, so, um, it in theory, okay, in theory, let's say there's a lot of potassium on this side and there's a little potassium on the other side. So in theory, it should be able to just go down, right, and um, down the concentration gradient. But sometimes these channel proteins can be gated. They can be closed. They don't allow things to go through, even if there's a gradient. Now, some what can open these gates? So you need to understand that these gates can be opened by... Um, any kind of signal like a chemical or mechanical signal. You don't need to know what that means right now, but there's some signals that can open this gate. And when it opens, now they can go through down the concentration gradient. Just know that this idea exists. Don't go too crazy about this because you don't, you honestly don't need to know more than, more than this about that, okay? Um, now, remember how I said for simple diffusion that it was... Um, non-selective, meaning as long as you fit these criteria, you can go through, okay? Now, for facilitated diffusion, it's in fact different. It's going to be selective. It's going to be specific. It's not going to be non-selective. It's going to be picky, okay? So what do I mean? So this channel, for example, will only allow potassiums. It will not allow chlorine. It will not allow chlorine because this channel is only a potassium channel. That's what I mean by being selectively permeable, being specific. So facilitated diffusion is selectively permeable. 
these channels only allow their own kind of thing to go through. They're specific, okay? So another kind of channel protein may allow chlorine, okay, but not potassium. So that's what I mean by specific. Make sure you understand that idea. Let me move this. Okay, so that's it for facilitated diffusion. I hope that makes sense. So notice the key difference from the um, simple diffusion is that it uses proteins. These two are the same, it's passive. And the molecules that it can carry is different from simple diffusion because they can also carry big molecules, unlike simple diffusion, and they can also carry hydrophilic molecules, okay, unlike simple diffusion. Okay, remember simple diffusion, if a molecule didn't, didn't like this area, it couldn't go through. But in this case, even if this molecule doesn't like this area, it can just take the protein instead. So that's important to understand. And remember how I said this carrier protein, it can change shape. This is what I mean. So for example, say there is, I need to show this, a lot of glucose on this side. Okay, it's a big molecule, so it needs to use this. And it's a little bit on the other side. This kind of carrier protein, how it works, instead of just allowing things to flow through, is it's going to grab that thing, okay? And then it's going to change shape and send it to the other side instead, like this. Now it's on the other side. So that's what a carrier protein does. And I remember it very well because it carries something across. It physically grabs it, changes shape, and drags it across, which is why it can carry hydrophobic things. Because, right, hydrophobic things don't like... I mean, that's why it can carry... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Hydrophobic things. Because hydrophobic, say this, this big thing here, um, it is too big to go through the membrane, okay? But at the same time, it's hydrophobic. So it doesn't really like... Um, no, don't worry about that. I don't want to go into that. That doesn't matter. That's not important for you guys right now. Just know that carrier protein can change shape. And by changing shape, it grabs something and it drags it across. Unlike the channel protein, which just allows it to float across. Okay, that's it. That's it for facilitated diffusion. I hope that makes sense. Now, now that we've done... We've done now simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Let's go into osmosis, okay? Osmosis. So osmosis, I'm going to use this kind of interesting diagram here. So osmosis is quite interesting, and it will make sense with this diagram. So we got a little idea here. You can pretend we got this bowl, okay, full of water, and we got this barrier in the middle, which is going to be our cell membrane, okay, our cell membrane. So the one side of the barrier has a lot of these little molecules here, these little molecules here you can see, very concentrated very full of these little molecules or these solutes. And the other side has, a lot, has the same amount of water but very little solutes. So it's, um, it's not as concentrated. Okay. Now, let's pretend now that, let's pretend now we have, we put holes in this membrane. Okay, we put holes in this membrane. And these holes are essentially going to be these proteins that we've just mentioned. Let me show you. Okay, you see these holes. And remember, this is a membrane. And remember from our membrane structure that we have all these proteins. So these holes that I put in this diagram is pretty much just a, a protein, a channel protein that has a hole in it, okay, and allows things to pass. So we're going to pretend this membrane has these holes in it. And we, and we call these proteins aquaporins because they allow water to pass so when you do this scenario okay so these holes they only allow water to pass they do not allow these solutes to pass so remember if we think about simple diffusion in simple diffusion um, and we pretend this allowed the solutes to pass in simple diffusion these molecules these solutes will move from where there's a lot to where there's a little until it's even right but right now this hole doesn't allow the solutes to pass. It only allows water to pass. So these solutes cannot move to make it even, even if they wanted to. So how else do you make this even? Because this side is very concentrated and this side is not concentrated. How can we make them even concentration? Well, water can move, right? Water can move. So let me show you. Water can move. So in this scenario, Instead of the solute moving to make it even, now the water is going to move to make it even. So if we have the water here move to this side to dilute this side, that is osmosis. So instead now, instead of the solute moving to even it out, now the water is going to move from the side where it's very dilute to the side where it's very concentrated. Because if some of the water moves to the side where it's very concentrated, now both sides will become equally dilute. Okay, Even though this side has much more water, 
it is equally as concentrated at this as this side, okay? I hope you understand what that means. That is pretty much what osmosis is. So I'm going to put words to it now. So osmosis is the movement of water from an area. Okay, there's two ways of defining this, okay? And, I'll, and I'm going to show it also on the next slide. But for now, know this one. The movement of water from an area of low solute concentration, meaning low amounts of solute, to an area of high amounts of solute. Okay, you can see the water moves from an area of low amounts of solute concentration to an area of high concentration, and thereby evening out the concentration. So that's another kind of transport. Only this kind of transport moves water. It doesn't move the solute itself. So just like facilitated diffusion, this one is very selective. Because what kind of molecule is allowed to move? Only water. So it's very selective. It's very picky. Okay, let's use this idea here. So our four points thing, right? We're always going to come to that. So for osmosis, what do we need? We need a protein. Okay, so if we look, these little holes, they represent our little channel protein. So we need a protein. It doesn't just move. The water doesn't just move through the membrane, through the membrane itself. It needs a protein. It needs a little protein called an aquaporin, okay? So these little holes, again, remember, they're aquaporins. So it needs that. It needs a gradient of some sort. In this case, the gradient, so you can, you can see there's a gradient. There's a lot of concentrated um, solute on this side and a little bit on this side. So it needs a gradient as well. And it moves down the concentration gradient. Guess why? Because this side, guess what? Has a lot of water concentration compared to this side, right? This side has way more water concentrate, um, um, this side has way more water compared to solutes, right? This side has way more solutes compared to water. So this side relatively has less water than this side. So in a way, there's a gradient. The water is moving from where there's a lot of water to where there's a little water. So it's moving down the gradient. The same thing. That's why there's a tick. It's moving down the concentration gradient. So there's two ways of defining it. You can either define, and I'm going to show it on the next slide, so don't worry. You can either define osmosis as water moving from where there's a, a very little solute to where there's a lot of solute or water moving from where there's a lot of water to where there's a little water either one is good and they and they're both and and so because there's this gradient and water moves naturally to even it out because the solutes can't move it also doesn't require energy it's atp just like facilitated diffusion just like simple diffusion this is a passive process there's a gradient so no atp is required now, this one is easier here, size and charge. What size is our molecule? Well, our molecule moving is what? It's water. Water is small and water is hydrophilic. It loves water. Water loves water. Water is water. So of course, water loves water. So water is going to move through these channels, right? Through these channels easily. Okay. Okay, great. So that is it now for the three passive ones. I hope that makes sense. We covered now simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis, okay? And I want to make one last thing clear before we go on to, uh, we need to do, uh, talk a little bit more about osmosis because a lot of key exam questions that can come up on, and I want to show them clearly before we go to active, active transport. So I want to make sure you really know what the difference is between osmosis and simple diffusion. So let me show you again osmosis. So we have a cup here. One side is little concentration of the solute, other side is more concentrated. So if this barrier here only allows water to pass, what's going to happen? Water will move from where there's a lot of water to where there's less water. Or you can think of it the other way, water will move from where there's a little solute to where there's a lot of solute to even out the concentration to dilute it. So naturally, this side will lose water to this side. That's osmosis. So let me put the word here for you. The movement of water down a concentration from an area of high water to an area of rel relatively lower water. Or, another way of defining it, the movement of water from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. Both of these definitions are okay. So how is that different from facilitated and simple diffusion? So if we have the same scenario, only this barrier is permeable, meaning it allows to pass these solutes, what will then happen? Because in this scenario of osmosis, the barrier did not allow these solutes to move, but this one does. So in that scenario, what happens? Well, because this barrier is permeable to these solutes, 
what will happen is the solute will move from the area of high concentration of solute to an area of low concentration until it's even. In this way, the water level does not change, right? So that's the difference between osmosis and simple diffusion. In osmosis, water moves. In facilitated and simple diffusion, the solute moves, okay? So if we had to put a definition, facilitated or simple diffusion was the movement of substances or solute down a concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that clears the difference between them. So now we need to talk about three key words, okay? And this is kind of fun. If you understand osmosis, this makes a lot of sense. So here we have a cell, okay? And we can see the inside of the cell, these are little, these are little solutes, okay? Little things dissolve. The inside of the cell is equally concentrated compared to the outside, okay? So there's also water outside the cell. And we're gonna pretend the outside is just as concentrated as the inside. So in this scenario, does osmosis um, happen? No, because the inside is equally as concentrated as the outside. So the water will just stay inside the cell. It won't move out or water from the outside won't move in, into the cell. Nothing will happen, okay? We call this scenario isotonic, okay? Very important word. So the outside of the cell, when we use this word, we refer to the outside of the cell. I like to think of it in terms of the outside of the cell. So the outside of the cell is isotonic, meaning the same concentration as the inside of the cell, okay? There's equal concentration of solute outside the cell compared to inside the cell. The, the, the scenario is isotonic, so nothing happens, okay? Next example is here. Now notice the difference. In this scenario, the inside of the cell is very concentrated with these solutes compared to the outside of the cell. Or you can say, the outside of the cell is low concentration compared to the inside of the cell. So if you know, if you understand osmosis, what do you think is going to happen? So remember, osmosis is movement from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. So we're saying the outside of the cell is less concentrated, okay? It's less concentrated. So the water will move from where there's less solute to where there's high solute, or where there's a lot of water to where there's little water. So the water in this scenario will move from the outside of the cell inside the cell, causing the cell to swell because the water is trying to dilute this, all the solutes. It's trying to make the concentration equal to the outside. Okay, so that's going to cause the cell to swell. So what kind of solution was this? We call this hypotonic. The outside is hypotonic. The outside is hypo means lower than. So the outside has a lower concentration of solute compared to the inside. So we call the outside hypotonic. Here it was isotonic. It was equal to the inside of the cell. Here it's hypotonic. So the outside concentration is lower. It's hypo. It's under the inside of the cell. And in this scenario, water will move from the outside to the inside of the cell, causing it to swell. Okay, the last scenario we need to look at here. You can imagine what it is. Now we have a scenario where the outside of the cell is a higher concentration of solutes than the inside of the cell. So what do you think will happen in terms of osmosis? So because osmosis is the movement of water from where there's a lot of water to where there's little water, or the movement of, wa a movement of water from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration because we're trying to dilute the outside because the outside is too concentrated, what's going to happen here? The cell is going to shrink. Water is going to leave the cell to dilute the outside. And that's going to cause the cell to kind of crumble up. Okay, it's going to cause it to shrink. So this is going to be called, guess what? Hypertonic, because the outside is hyper, more concentrated with these solutes compared to the inside. So when you use this word, iso, hypo, hypertonic, think of it, I like to remember it, it's very easy to remember if you think of this word in terms of how the outside of the cell is like compared to the inside of the cell. The outside here is the same, it's iso, the outside here is hypo concentrated, um, I mean, hypo, um, less concentrated, hypo concentrated. And in this one, it's hyper concentrated. It's very concentrated compared to the inside of the cell. And then you can just think what will happen in terms of osmosis. Okay, now my question is, why on earth do we care about this? Why? Why am I telling about this weird scenario? Well, it's actually very important in terms of medicine. When you get an organ transplant, so say someone's, you need a new heart, your heart, your, your heart's failing. Think about it. Someone's heart needs to be taken out of someone else's body, right? And it is not taken out of the someone else's body and then directly put into your body. There's an intermediate step. 
when they take out the heart, they need to put it into some bag or some container um, um, while they transport it to you, to your body, right? So think about it. Your heart is made up of cells. Now, your heart will be put into a certain solution. And if that solution that is being put into is anything except this one, your heart will die. The, the heart that you're getting donated will die. Because say you're putting your, your, you can pretend this is the heart, and you're putting it into a solution that's isotonic, then the cells will remain okay. They will stay the, the right shape. But if you put your heart into a solution that is hypotonic, then your heart will swell and it might burst, okay? If you put your heart into a solution that's hypertonic, it might shrivel up. So this is super important, this scenario, in the terms of transplantation. When you remove your heart from your body, you got to make sure you put it into a container or a solution for the meanwhile that is that is isotonic, okay? So that this heart doesn't change, the cells don't get disturbed, okay? Now, let's move on to the last one here, okay? Almost there, guys. I know there's a lot of information, but this one is actually very straightforward. Last one here, active transport. So this one, if we go back to analogy, um, is the opposite. So imagine you opened your door and somehow heat left your house. That is pretty much what active transport is, okay? It is not natural. This will never happen. Imagine it's super hot outside and you open your door and somehow it gets colder inside your house. That's impossible, right? That is not going to happen naturally. And that's what active means. It means it happens through energy. It cannot happen naturally. For you to make your house colder on the inside, you need to you need to, when you open your door, you need to put on the AC, you need to spend energy, right? It's not going to happen naturally. So that's what active transport is. When something moves from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration, this requires energy. This is not natural. Let me show you what I mean. So again, here we have our cell. Um, this one will be relatively quicker to explain. And remember, remember this one, this one, the channel protein was only used in passive transport. It is not going to be used, be used in active transport, whereas the carrier protein can be used in both. So here, now it's being used for active transport. Okay, let's go. So first, active transport needs proteins. It does not happen with the membrane itself. It needs these proteins. Second, this is where it gets opposite. It goes against the concentration gradient. So let me give you an example. Say we have some kind of thing. Let's say potassium. Okay. Say we have one on this side. Well, actually, let's put many on this side. Say we have four on this side, and we have one on this side. In, in, um, in facilitated diffusion, it would move from this side down the concentration gradient to even it out. But in active transport, okay, the opposite is going to happen. We're going to move this thing against the concentration gradient from where there's a little to where there's a lot. So... In active transport, it goes against the concentration gradient, not down the concentration gradient. So that's why I put this cross here. It goes against it. Now, because it goes against it, guess what? That requires energy. This does not happen naturally. This requires ATP. And I'll show you what I mean just now. So if we remember, only the carrier protein can do this. So let's say we want to move this potassium to the other side. Now, what's going to happen is this little thing here, this, this carrier protein, will grab this potassium and in order for it to change shape, remember it can change shape, to send this potassium to the other side, it's not going to do that naturally now because it's moving it against the concentration gradient. So in order to make this carrier protein do that, we need to spend ATP. We need to, an ATP molecule will come here and tell it, Zzz. okay, do your job. Then it's going to change shape and send it to the other side. Okay, so it's going it's to be like, hmm going to change shape once the ATP allows it to. Once it changes shape, now this potassium can be released to the other side. Okay, so know that active transport, in fact, requires ATP. This ATP molecule is going to go and activate this carrier protein to change shape, to send it, to send this whatever it is against the concentration gradient. Okay, cool. Let me change this back. Now, what kind of molecules need, last one, right? What kind of molecules need to do active transport? So again, size and charge. Well, it can be big or small. The molecule can be big or it can be small, either one. Um, molecule can be hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Either one's okay, okay? Um, now, you need to know 
um, because again, these molecules cannot go through the membrane for one or other reason, and we want to move them against the concentration gradient. Now, you need to know that active transport is also selective, meaning this pump here, again, is made to transfer potassium, okay, or it's made to transfer sodium, okay, it's made for specific molecules, it doesn't move any molecules, okay, it only moves some, okay, so it's selective. So why on earth would we want to do this? Why would we want to have things not be even? Why would you want the outside to be, have something more compared to the inside? Well, in short, in your body, sometimes equality is not wanted for some or other reason, and I won't explain it here because you guys don't need to know it. There are reasons for you, for your body. In some scenarios, your body would want potassium to be all on the outside, or it wanted to be all on the inside for some reason. You don't need to know any specific reason, but know that sometimes equality is not wanted. Sometimes your cell wants more of something on the outside than the inside, or more of something on the inside than the outside. And for that scenario, we would use active transport because it's not natural and that's going to require ATP. So lastly, one kind of pump you need to know about is a sodium potassium pump. And this kind of pump, what it does is, um, you don't actually need to know what it does is, but this pump moves sodium and potassium against their concentration gradient. So that's all you need to know. It's a sodium potassium pump. It works with potassium and sodium only. Okay, it's specific to sodium potassium and it moves them against their concentration gradient from where there's a little to where there's a lot okay so that's it for active transport now i want to make a summary because it's very important so in terms of when you think about membrane transport you need to know right that you need to consider four things whether there's a protein used or not whether there's a concentration gradient or not like whether it's down the concentration gradient or against the concentration gradient or if it requires ATP, and what kind of molecules move using that kind of transport, okay? You need to know these four, four things. So here I have a nice summary that includes everything we talked about in this video. You can see passive transport here, including these three types, and active transport, including this, its own type, right? And you can see for um, simple diffusion, there was no protein, facilitated diffusion, these two proteins, osmosis, this protein, active transport, the carrier protein, and for all of the passive transports, it was down the concentration gradient or along the concentration gradient. And this required no ATP, whereas for active transport, it was the opposite. It was against the concentration gradient, like while going with um, ski against up, up the hill, which is impossible. And that requires ATP. And then the molecules for a simple diffusion, the molecules were small and nonpolar. Otherwise, they couldn't fit through the membrane. For facilitated diffusion, it could be small or big, polar or nonpolar. Um, and same for active transport, whereas for osmosis, it was small and polar because the molecule is water. So that is a nice summary. If you know this, you've got it nailed. Now let's do some IB questions. That was a lot, right? I hope that made sense, okay? I hope it at least helped you. So here we go. The diagram shows a section through a membrane. What are the modes of transport in the diagram? So we can see here um, bilayer, the membrane. We can see here a channel protein, and we can see some little solutes, some little molecules. Now in one, we see the molecule is moving from where there's a lot to where there's a little on the other side. So this is definitely passive. So we know it's going to be simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, or osmosis, okay? But we see that there's no membrane in the in number one. So we know it's going to be simple, okay? Great. So it's going to be either A or C. We have to figure out what two is. So we have here we have this molecule. It's moving from where there's a lot to where there's a little, but this time using a channel protein. So this is going to be facilitated diffusion. So it's going to be, the answer will be C. Oh, man. Give me a second. Here. Okay, next one. What does C, this is why you need to know those four things, because here they ask about three of them. What does facilitated diffusion across a cell membrane require? Facilitated diffusion, remember? That one requires a protein, right? Either the carrier or the channel protein, either one. Uh, does it require ATP? No, because it was a passive process. So it's going to be yes, no. So it can be either B, A, or C so far. Now, does it require a concentration gradient? Yes. Remember, it goes down the concentration gradient. Okay, very important. So the answer is also C in this scenario. So that's why it's super important to know those three 
those four things, okay? Because already they will quiz you on those. Okay, which type of transportation happens in the sodium potassium pump? So remember, I just told you one example of active transport that you should know is the sodium potassium pump. Just know that example. You don't need to know what it what it's useful for. You just need to know this example. That's all you need to know because it can come up in a multiple choice question just like this. So sodium potassium pump is involved not in facilitated, not in osmosis, not in simple, but in active transport. Okay, what is osmosis? So remember, there's two definitions of osmosis that you can know. Let's see um, the answer here. So A, the movement of water through a membrane from a low to high solute concentration. That's in fact the answer. Okay, it's when you move from a low solute concentration to a high solute concentration so that the water can dilute out the side with the high solute concentration. So the other ones will not be correct. Okay, this one's a bit trickier, so let's see if you can do this. I'll have a nice, nice diagram if you can't do it. So the salt concentration inside an animal cell is 1.8. I'm going to show you this. Uh, whereas the outside, the surrounding area, is 5%. So all they want, they don't, don't worry about the numbers. All you need to know is that the one number is lower than the other number. So they're trying to tell you that the inside of this animal cell, the concentration of a solute, is lower compared to the outside, meaning the outside is more concentrated with the solute. That's all they want you to know. They don't, don't care about the actual numbers. Just know one is higher than the other. So don't overthink it. Now, what is the likely response? So based on osmosis, what's the likely response? The outside is very concentrated, and we know osmosis is the movement of water from low solute concentration to high solute concentration, or the movement from high water to low water. So in this case, what will happen to the cell? The water will leave, so the cell will shrivel up, because the, because we are, the cell is in, is in a hypertonic environment. The outside is hyper, higher concentration of the solute compared to the inside of the cell, causing the cell to shrink. So will, will it be A, the cell will gain water from the medium? No. The cell will lose salt. No, it will not lose salt. Um, it will lose water. The cell will remain unchanged. No. The cell will shrink from water loss. Yes, that's the correct answer. So that's it for this video. I really hoped it helped. Um, I really hoped you learned something. I hope it really um, uh, made sense. And basically, um, if you can nail this, table here, you got it nailed. Okay, so I hope that was useful and I'll see you in the next one.